You're listening to the Visualizing War podcast. In each episode, we talk about representations of war in art, text, film, and music. With new guests each time, we look at how people have described or imagined war in different periods and places. And we discuss the impact which war stories have on us as individuals and societies. Hello, my name is Alice Koenig. And my name is Nicholas Vieta. And we co-direct the Visualizing War project at the University of St. Andrews. Our guest today is Rosie Kay, a dancer and choreographer and founder of the Rosie Kay Dance Company. Rosie has created a number of award-winning productions, and today we want to talk to her about one in particular called Five Soldiers, The Body is the Front Line. A sellout show at the Edinburgh Festival and the winner of multiple awards, Five Soldiers is an incredible piece of physical theatre, which captures the experiences of one woman and four men as they train, prepare for war, and eventually deploy to Afghanistan. It really gives us a glimpse of modern military culture, of how women fare in the army um, as well, and of what it's like to be on deployment, what it's like to be a soldier, to be at war, both physically and mentally. It's focused particularly on bodily experiences and it visualizes war in really interesting and thought provoking ways. So we're very excited to ask Rosie how it came about, what she was trying to communicate with it and also what audiences have made of it. So Rosie, we're delighted to have you with us. Thanks very much for making time to talk to us today. Lovely to be here. Thank you for having me. So Rosie, you've been a dancer all your life. But in 2007, you had quite a serious injury, um, I think, and you had to stop dancing for a while. And I understand that's when the idea of five soldiers came to you. So do you want to kick us off by just telling our listeners what happened to you and how that then led to you creating a dance show about soldiers? Sure. So, um, yes, I, I, I was a, have been a dancer all my life and was starting to kind of go into the world of choreography and uh it was actually like December 2006, I was in a big show and I suffered a really serious injury on my left leg. And I was probably right at the peak of my performing powers then. So it was kind of pretty devastating. I was told that I would never dance again and it would take me up to a year to walk again properly. So I give everything up, pull the money together for the knee operation. Um, and then woke up and sort of discovered actually my knee wasn't as bad as everyone had said it was. But a couple of nights after the operation, and I think the anaesthetic had had a kind of profound effect on me, I had a dream. I was in my parents' home in their spare room sort of recuperating, and a very, what I can only describe as a vision-like dream, where I was lying on a desert battlefield with bombs going off around me, and I looked down and I saw my own body and my left leg had been blown off and I could see my left leg lying sort of further away from me. And my first thought was, oh shit, <laughs> I've just lost my leg. But then my second thought was quite odd. I wondered where did the soul reside in the body? And if I lost my arms and my legs, <laughs> would I still be rosy? And the answer was yes. And would I still want to dance? And the answer inside of myself was, was yes. And so I woke up with all these kind of confused ideas about um, my body and my soul and my connection uh, within myself. Um, and I went downstairs, made a cup of coffee, I put on the TV and at that point it was uh, the Iraq war. And I think we'd all been living in quite an uncomfortable place about uh, the reasons for going to war. A million people had protested against the war, the war still went ahead. I think there was quite an ambiguous relationship with the British military at that point. This is pre big charities uh, like Help for Heroes. And I saw the faces of young men killed in Iraq. And for the first time, I, I sort of put myself almost in their shoes and they stopped just being these sort of signifiers and they suddenly were real people with real bodies. And I just wondered, so I trained since I was, actually since I was three <laughs> to withstand pain, um, to push my body into different shapes and, and, and positions. Um, but I love my job and I'd have done anything to get back on that stage. But you know, you risk injury, you don't risk your life. So I, I really wondered how do you train to risk not just profound injury, but to actually risk your life as part of your job and know that that's one of the risks, that's a profound risk of your job. 
And I just wondered if they were a bit more like dancers, soldiers. I just wondered if maybe they really, really loved their jobs. And that's how they could take such strong risks. That, that was the basic premise that morning. And that stuck with me ever since. And, and there, was a, there was a truth in there. There was a truth to that that took me many years to, to prove, but, but the, the instinct had been correct. So it then took me a long time, but I managed to get um, embedded research with, with the army. So you felt a very strong personal connection, which got you looking at the army, at soldiers from a completely different angle. And you found this was something that was really interesting to explore. Um, And I think you've said in the past that all the dance that you do is about, you know, wanting to make work about the world we live in. And I think you've talked a bit about the fact that we have war artists, we have war poets. So why not have war dance as a way of exploring what fighting is about, what war is about. So I suppose at that time, you know, there was, I was doing quite a lot of reevaluating w- what I was doing and where I was going forward. And if I wanted to be a choreographer, you know, I was gonna have to really commit to it. And what kind of work did I want to make? And I actually probably couldn't think of anything more terrifying than looking at war. It felt such an alien world. It felt um, incredibly male. But also my, my father was very interested in military history. And so I'm a little bit of a military ner- nerd. I, I, I read all the Sharp novels when I was working in Polish dance theatre. And, you know, I, I had this kind of like, I was quite interested in strategy. So I actually applied for a RAIN Foundation Fellowship. And in that interview, which was to give me some money to allow myself some time to research, Um, I I explained this idea that I wanted to tackle the really big stuff, the really big things you shouldn't talk about at dinner parties. So my my trilogy was war, religion and politics. And that became the trilogy of Five Soldiers, There Is Hope and NK Ultra, um, which I only just finished a couple of years ago. And finally, it was it was through somebody who knew somebody who knew somebody who knew a retired general. I managed to speak to him on the phone and we were talking for a long time and he was really, you know, a bit sceptical to begin with. And that actually was my argument. You know, there are war poets, war artists, war photographers. I was very interested in particularly the work of Otto Dix and this idea of um, never flinch, never look away. That that had stuck with me since, since I was a teenager. There was an amazing Weimar art exhibition when I was a teenager in Edinburgh. But yet the medium of a soldier's job is their body. And maybe I, as a choreographer, with a deep understanding of the body and what it means, maybe I could look at this in a a new way, in a different way. And I think that was the the argument that won him. And and then he helped me get a placement with the 4th Battalion and the Rifles. So it sounds like there there was an almost natural interface between, you know, you, you work with your own body and the physicality of being a soldier, but it was also quite challenging to kind of put this on stage. And I think we'll talk a bit more about how you manage this in the end in a minute. But before we do that, maybe you could just give us and our listeners a bit of an outline of the show. And just to tell our listeners, there's an amazing video on your website from the 2017 live stream of the show on rosyk.co.uk, which is very worth watching. Uh, Before we all go off and do that, could you give us a bit of an idea of what's happening in the show? Sure. So it's a one hour show. The way I like to do it is in quite small areas. So the audience sits on three sides and it's quite close to the action. And we like to do that in in drill halls or in military environments. So you kind of get a sense of the sort of the architecture of these places as you go in as well. But we also like doing it in theatres. The soldiers, stroke dancers, are already on stage. It's like that is their terrain. Everything's held within a sort of nine by nine metre square. And they're sort of framed in with scaffolding. that sort of like almost like a boxing ring holds them together. So this is both a, a real and an imagined place. This could be purgatory. And this could be on a cycle that these five individuals are going through in perpetuity. On the back is a screen, a projection screen which sometimes has real imagery from Afghanistan um, and sometimes has weather data, kind of data spinning through, and sometimes it becomes a more imaginary kind of effect um, to the the dance as well. So there's four men, there's one woman. They are very tightly ranked. 
there's a junior officer, there is a sergeant or a, a sort of a non-commissioned officer, and there are two squaddies, and then the female, because when I made it, females weren't on the front line as soldiers, they were medics. So the female role started as a medic, and now I'd say that she's a fellow soldier. They are mucking around, picking their noses, sort of sorting their boots out, getting told off, slightly kind of harassing one another very gently. Um, and then they go through the first 10 minutes is a kind of representation of a lot of the stereotypes in a way that we're used to seeing marching soldiers stepping in time, um, looking terribly fit and sort of holding themselves together, almost like becoming a machine. And there's this one section of what we call drill or maths drill, uh, which is made up of literally only about five or six steps of salutes and um, attention and at ease. And it's one of the most complicated pieces of choreography any dancer ever does. And I've had to do it on stage and it, your mind plays tricks with you. Um, it's so it's, it's deceptively like simple, but actually soldiers really understand how complicated and precise that is. And so you think you're lulled into this kind of sense that they're just a machine and they're kind of, you only get these tiny little moments where you go, oh, hang on, what's, there's a story there or someone's kind of, it's, it's almost like what's going on inside their heads just pops out for a moment and you get to see it. Almost like they're on a really long march and then somebody says something really stupid. And then that's over and they chill out and they relax and they're silly. Um, they have PT, physical training, uh, chucking tyres around, um, kind of to really strong clash music. And that all starts to get out of hand. They start to kind of like get a bit argy-bargy. And then there's a big sort of party scene where I'm thinking in my head, they're out in Salisbury going to the nightclubs. Um, and that's where things get really complicated because the female's extracted herself um, from the kind of aggressive banter and drinking environment and then it all gets quite sort of metaphysical I'm not sure where we are that could be they're looking at a stripper in their heads it could be a real person that could be back at barracks who knows it's a sort of space where they then look at the woman and they look at her as prey and these are trained predators and they start to kind of almost are about to attack her and she retaliates and and shames them really calls them out on it at which point they kind of turn into sort of puppy dogs really and they and they they worship her both as queen and country and the sort of archetype of what it may be that men across millennium have fought for after that it's this kind of like waiting zone where we see a lot more the psychological moments the tensions the loves the hates that then actually you can't you can't not get on with somebody because you depend on them so you have these very intense relationships with each other and then finally the third part is deployment and they're dropped into an imaginary territory I've never really decided if it's Iraq or Afghanistan I suppose it's a little bit more based on Afghanistan because there is no enemy and that was very much from what I understood of the tactics of the Taliban when they started to plant IEDs rather than um, firefights. So they're on patrol, it turns into a firefight and then somebody steps on an IED and that moment is pulled out and out and out. And so something that would happen in a split second happens over about two minutes and he drops to the floor and they have to be really careful, but they, run to him um, as carefully as possible, sort of making sure they're not stepping on any more IEDs. They put him into recovery and then we sort of metaphorically carry him back to the UK. So across sort of what would be different vehicles and medibacks and um, air hospitals. And then um, we switch and the very last part of the show um, is in a Headley Court style environment where this young soldier who's been one of the fittest and most vigorous of the team is now relearning how to walk. And at first he's kind of laughing and then he gets very frustrated and then he's on his own and it becomes a dance, almost like a, um, a floor dance, like street floor work um, where he learns to pirouette and balance on, on, his, on his knees. Um, so we strap his ankles back. So you can see that he's still got his legs, but the, the point is that somebody who was a fighter is now fighting in a very different way. 
uh, is fighting to regain his sense of himself. That's an extremely uh, complex plot that takes us really from stereotypes of soldiering via the, the social and cultural issues and sort of the, the gender issues that are, that are involved via real battle action to the question of, of veterans and, uh, and wounded soldiers. So you can imagine how complex it is to represent all of this on stage without much, without dialogue. It's all through movement, through dance, through the choreography. Is there music involved as well? How did you get this rhythm into your dancers? Because I mean, that, that's the thing that keeps them all together, right? At different stages of the play. Well, I suppose that's the sort of interesting thing in that, this, that there are similarities between dancers and soldiers and that listening, that listening to each other, that listening to those, those rhythms you're talking about, but also the kind of unspoken rules. We live within worlds with actually quite strict hierarchies. I mean, now having sort of restaged the show over 10 years, the first thing I do is drill and drill all together. And now I understand why the army use drill because it, you know, it, it gets them in step. It gets them really thinking. It gets them working as a team. And then as an outsider, as the, the sort of the choreographer or the officer watching them, I get to see how they react under pressure. Nobody's going to get hurt. You know, it's just steps, it's just drill, but it means so much. And you can see who's the one that get, wants to get it right all the time, but becomes a bit of a pain in the ass. And then who's the one that keeps getting it wrong and the others turn on them. And then who's the one that's the peacemaker and trying to get the team to work together. You know what I mean? It's like suddenly you're like, oh, that's why they do drill. It gets them into one mindset, but you also see the strengths and weaknesses of a team. So the music's really important, standing relationship with Annie Matheny, who's um, a doctor of music at Birmingham University. But we worked together, um, I think when she was still a student. And she and I went to military bases and recorded lots of atmospheric sound, um, Chinooks landing, the noises inside these buildings, the air conditioning units. Um, and she turned it into this huge atmospheric score that holds the whole piece in this almost purgatorial environment. There's, there's a sense of impending doom from, you know, it's, it's clocks ticking at the start, it's radio noises that include radio for transcripts. And then we go into this great sort of atmosphere. And then she's very kind and lets me weave in cultural references that are recognizable or classical music that I felt was really important both to put on a kind of profound um, religious, you know, I ended up going to so many um, army services, both in Tidworth and Salisbury, in different places. And the, the, the use of ideas of sacrifice seemed quite alien uh, to, to, to somebody from secular civilian society, but actually I, I used a huge deal. deal. So I, I, I knew I wanted some sort of sacred religious music in there. So we've got the clash um, for that kind of punk element, that sort of wild rock and roll. Uh, we've got uh, Katy Perry for when they go clubbing, just some really cheesy pop music that they all go crazy to. Um, and then we've got the Pergolesi Stay But Mater, um, which I use different elements for. One part is used um, in a love duet, one part is used in a sort of heli imaginary helicopter dance where they're flying over Afghanistan and they all imagine that they're sort of flying through the air. They weren't, but, but they, you know, there's this kind of amazing romanticism inside the terror sometimes. Soldiers talked about the beauty of Afghanistan. Um, and then right at the end, um, we use it for the solo where he's discovering his new body, the soldier's discovering his new body. And that of course is a piece of music where the mother of Christ is holding her dying son and hearing his heartbeat slow. And I wasn't a mother when I made this show, but now as a mother, I interviewed quite a lot of mothers that had lost their sons in Iraq and Afghanistan. And just that, that knowledge that the job that they're doing could lead to this risk was, was really strong for me. So Rosie, it's really fascinating to hear you talk about this, the authenticity of some of the elements, the musical score with bringing in sounds that were recorded in you know, military bases, but also this music like the Pergolesi that transports you to sort of much greater ideas that plays with symbolism and so on. 
so you're, you're sort of moving us between reality and archetypes and reality and universals. And I think that's part of the depth of this piece. You've mentioned a few times some of the research that you did for it. Obviously, you knew yourself what it was like to learn how to walk again. But can you talk us through some of the other research? You, you ended up embedding with an infantry battalion with four rifles, I think. So what, what was that like and what did you learn from it? How did it affect the show? It was absolutely extraordinary, extraordinary experience. I'm really grateful that they put up with me. I, I got this sort of long list of kit that I had to take. I had to take like two suitcases and arrived at um, Bulford Barracks. Fortunately, I was kind of being treated a little bit like an embedded journalist, a little bit like a junior officer. Um, so I got to stay in the officer's mess, which was which was great. So we I dressed for dinner. My, my dad was brilliant because he'd really warned me, dress up for dinner. It's really important. Dress up for dinner, silver service, you know, soup, eat your soup away, all this business. And sat and, and just introduced myself to the mostly quite junior officers, um, a lot of them who'd had experience uh, in Iraq. And they just told me everything that I needed to know and help me pack because the next morning, very early, we all set off for a four day and night exercise on Dartmoor, which was just sitting on a bus, you know, with 50 soldiers and then getting to Oak Hampton while they all kind of loaded their ammunition. And I, I got sort of put with uh, somebody who designed the exercise. So I was kind of basically literally shadowing him, like running behind him. And I kept thinking, oh, you know, they'll, they'll make compensation for me, you know. But I, I also had been really clear that I wanted to join in as much as possible. So I had like full Bergen, full uniform, helmet, body armor, and it was so heavy. And um, that's it, we just, we just, you just set off um, into the dark um, for four days and nights, uh, with live fire, exercises, everything. Um, I didn't know what on earth was going on to begin with. I, I was sort of running down hills in Dartmoor. And if you know Dartmoor, it's really boggy. It's really like you can suddenly fall into a bog up to your waist. And it's, I was just thinking, my, poor, my knees, my knees, <laughs> my injuries. I don't want to get injured. I've got a show coming up. Um, so I was really thinking, you know, you should cause strength. And like the, you know, the, the pain of it was, was, was quite intense. The cold, the wet, the rain. But through it, I kind of found something and I stayed with it and um, I kind of kept a sense of humour and I, I actually started sort of supporting a little bit when like troops can get very, very disorientated from the lack of sleep and you're in these big strange exercises um, or in a huge Napoleonic fort and I mean it was just, it was like something out of a movie um, but I got really into it and so when we came back one of the soldiers said Ah, oh, you did. You did quite well there, actually, Rosie. And I was like, "Oh, how's that?" And it's well, you, you, you stayed with it. You know, you, you, you kept going. Uh, and I'd, I'd also thought that there would be more women. I thought the army was now at that point ten percent had female soldiers, but of course it was an infantry battalion. The only other woman had been a medic who twisted her ankle in the first half hour, and she was off. So I was literally the only woman out of about one hundred and fifty male troops and officers. I really did feel that strain of like, I'm not just Rosie, a choreographer. I am representing the fact that a woman might get through this and might, you know, be strong enough to handle this. So we got back to base. I spent quite a lot of time seeing how they lived, what they did, hanging out, doing PT. We did like Geneva convention training. It was the time of Remembrance Day. So a lot of religious services, as I've said, um, a lot of chatting um, onto the range and this was quite a difficult moment where I was asked if I wanted to use a rifle and, and, and practice we were zeroing so practice um, firing and I made the decision I would I would try it because I learned something really interesting you get your body very very still and very strong you're lying on the ground and then you breathe in and you breathe out and you squeeze the trigger very gently between heartbeats and that's something I could really understand. And then it turned out as quite a good shot, which was a bit scary and they didn't think it was too funny. And I think because of that, they then asked me to join um, a three day exercise on Salisbury Plain in an abandoned village. And I was actually to be a, a fighter, a, an insurgent. So I went there with a slightly different group of soldiers and I had a sergeant um, who trained me 
and we set up a huge ambush against a different battalion, it was against the Coldstream Guards, so a very different way of speaking. So the Coldstream Guards, uh, they have a different culture than the rifles. Everyone in the rifles are riflemen, whereas in the Coldstream Guard, it's a very sort of, there's much more strict rules around uh, protocol of speech. And so I could already see like this, this weird tension between like the different tribes of the army itself and went back to base, scrubbed up, somebody gave me a nice pot of tea and some toast and I had to go home and I actually cried on the way home and was really confused, like proper confused. I'd gone from being a terrified outsider to literally being a fighter within the space of two weeks. Now I know that, you know, as an artist, we're a little bit, um, subjective you know we kind of get into the role and get a bit carried away but this was profound I mean I really thought I was a pacifist and I wouldn't fight and I would never have been a soldier and then I suddenly realized I could have been so I think I had some kind of breakdown after that that Christmas and my, my mum very kindly looked after me my mum's a very strong peace activist and I think had she kind of been really against it, it would have been very difficult, but she really sort of helped me through understanding that it had been an artistic experience, not a career experience. And then that kind of became quite balanced out because, well, they went off to Afghanistan early the next year. I spent time at Headley Court, by which point the tactics had changed and Headley Court was dealing with all these new injuries. You know, they, they were saying like, it's been like 10 years of sprained ankles and now suddenly, suddenly, you know, we're, we're having to learn totally new skills about rehabilitation. And then I actually got to work at Selly Oak, um, Royal Centre for Defence Medicine. Selly Oak's now moved. But by that point, people that I knew from Four Rifles were in Selly Oak, having been medevaced back with profound life-changing injuries. So at that point, it really stopped being your research research and it started being about real people with very changed bodies and changed lives. And I think in a way, you, one of the things that you've just been saying goes back to one of your earlier points, you know, when you had that dream, when you were injured yourself, you started to find a connection between a dancer and a soldier. And then your immersive experience with the rifles really took that connection, that, that sense that you could have been a soldier much further. And it's a question, it's an issue that most civilians don't ever break down and it's much easier for us to pigeonhole soldiers as soldiers and other and these people who we are not that process that you've been through of interrogating well can anyone become a soldier what's it like when you step over some of those lines it's very interesting Rosie I think in Sally Oak you met up with um, Harry Parker who's our podcast guest next week um, who himself had been medevaced back with very life-changing injuries, hadn't he? Yeah, I'd worked with David Cotterell, an artist, and he was in residency at Selly Oak, and so he texted me before it was in the papers that Harry, he's like, I think you know Harry, and I said, like, I absolutely know Harry. So I went to visit him at Selly Oak, and, you know, it was sort of ward after ward after ward of, of injured um, soldiers, all, you know, with their own level of banter and and you know army sense going on but yeah it was um it was really shocking um to see Harry and uh he was very 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 ill when I saw him in fact I'm not even sure he remembers I visited <laughs> but then yeah we we formed a, a strong friendship to this day and very interested in in the arts and military and all its different purposes yeah. Um, Rosie, coming back for a moment to your experience when, when you were embedded with the soldiers and uh, you really learned this kind of full immersive, intensive e experience about um, about being a soldier. What would you say were sort of the main lessons you, you took away from this in terms of how you had imagined what military life being a soldier would be like and what's different, but also what did you take with you from this in terms of how to represent that on stage? One of the big things was going back to that original question, like, like, how do you take those risks and sort of passing through the eye of a needle with that, I think, was when I, I was sort of sent like you, you've got to attack over there. And I leapt out of a window, <laughs> forgetting that it was on the third floor <laughs> and just kind of landed and rolled and, and, and sort, of, sort of fled into a ditch. And just that was the moment I was like, ah. I didn't think about the risk to my knee, to my body. I did it because I knew this was the moment and I'd been told and it was really important. And that was the bit that I was like, 
oh my goodness, like, wow. So it's a really complex sort of thing that happens. You, you're tested at every moment and your reactions, both conscious and unconscious, are checked. So you can't fake it and you can't pretend and you can't try and get away with it. They really test to find out like who you are and how you deal with things. And so that can be quite obvious. You know, can you drag a tire across a massive football pitch or can you try? Can you then drag it with someone in it, you know, or, and at least try? That's really clear. Physical prowess and determination to try. That's really clear. But it's in those also smaller interactions where they check what kind of person you are, what kind of character you have. At each point, you're sort of passing through an invisible gateway. And if you pass, you don't even realise that you've passed, but something else opens up to you. Something else opens up to you. I think it was when I got told off coming back from remembrance service at Salisbury Cathedral I got told off for being at lunch in a suit and I should have been in my uniform and and it was like a, an officer had been looking after me he actually he'd forgotten that I wasn't a junior officer and I'd made a massive faux pas he'd forgotten I was a civilian I was kind of like ah okay I won't say anything I'll just I kept a diary and I, I tried to keep myself a little bit sane with, you know, pulling myself, you know, I'd go to my room and I'd write everything down and just try and remind myself who I was. So, so that's where I think I lost, lost touch with, with my civilian self because it was so complex, this getting in and getting trusted. Yes, I just wanted to ask a bit more about how that then translates into the stage. So one of the things I'm thinking about right now is you were saying everything happens in this kind of well-defined, confined space. So I'm just wondering whether in a way this how you're depicting this military life that is, is a world of its own, whether this is one of the ways in which you represent something like this on stage by making clear that everything happens within this sort of well-defined uh, square so to speak. <laughs> that's um, right, that's right. Well, it's sort of like, you know, the army themselves call it behind the wire. They do for very, both both for safety reasons, but also for psychological reasons, keep themselves separate. I think there was once a female officer at a post-show talk, talked about, you know, we, we do stuff that you don't really want to know about. You know, it, we do some of the nasty stuff in the world. Um, and so that means that we find it sometimes difficult to talk to civilians about this. And I think this show in some way opens up just that dialogue and that space to actually talk about, these are still human beings in extraordinary situations that can be incredibly stressful and also completely parallel, incredibly boring. So how I ended up, the five is, Silly, really, because that was the only number of dancers I could afford <laughs> to, to create the work and tour the work. So within those five, I had to find the right level of archetypes and sort of decided to focus on them being young. And so the one who's got the most sort of authority is still very much a junior officer, he's a lieutenant or something like that to me. Although, look, who was in the show for years, got himself to captain. <laughs> These are young people in quite extraordinary situations very claustrophobic and yet also I wanted them to tell lots and lots of different stories about you know who they are as individuals but then also this kind of group pack mentality they have um, together as well. So do, do you think um, you were saying earlier that uh, contrary to your expectations you were the only woman in this uh, in this quite large group of men is, is this something that sort of then also made you think about the dynamics between men and women because you were saying earlier that part of your play obviously is the relationship between the men and the women uh, on stage where did, where did that come from uh, so i've got a sort of funny anecdote about that actually because there was one boring day um on barracks where um someone said hey, do you want to come and do hockey practice with us rosie and i was like oh yeah i used to love hockey at school so we went off to Tidworth and we, we did like this really, really solid couple of hours. You know, it was really well organised, incredibly exhausting hockey practice. And there was one soldier who just kept calling me the ball girl. Oh, run and get that ball girl. And I was really, really upset. 
Um, and even one of the other officers was like, oh, you know, come on, stop that. Stop you know, being a bit rude there to, to the one female sort of thing. And I just sort of, I, I sort of decided that I would swear if I could, but I just, you know, just had to sort of deal with it. So I went back to my, my room in the barracks and I wrote my diary and I felt a bit sorry for myself. And then I was like, no, hang on. This is the army. This is the real army. You know, pull yourself together. It is scary. And it was a sort of posh dinner that night. So I had a really, really nice dress and I did my hair really properly and I put on makeup and I wore some high heels. And it was the first time kind of out of uniform for ages. And I sort of sashayed into the sort of dining room and, oh, I'll have a gin and tonic, please. And literally all the men were just like, oh, oh my goodness, you know, it's a female. And I remember like just crossing my legs and suddenly, you know, 10 pairs of eyes were all suddenly on my leg crossing. And that's where that moment where, where the female just, she could be on her own stretching. She just moves her leg and these eyes are like, you know, like target, boom, on it. And so that's where I was like, okay, there's this strange power. And I wouldn't, you know, I'm, I'm a feminist. So I wouldn't condone, you know, trying to use sex as a power, but there was, there was this power of, of suddenly in a male environment, being an attractive female. And they talk about that. They talk about how on, on tour, you know, that suddenly a woman that they've kind of just sort of thought of as normal suddenly becomes absolutely so attractive to them and they're really starved of, of love and affection. Yeah, that's where, that's where the kind of like the first moment where the, the, the female soldier moves and the men watch her came from a real experience. <laughs> I have to say nothing else, you know, nothing bad happened whatsoever. I just was aware that there was a hypocrisy, which is within society as a whole, but it was really highlighted um, that the men could talk about um, slags and whores in one breath and then talk about wives and girlfriends and families with such respect the next. And then of course you also have, you have queen and country in, in most rooms there's a picture of queen. And, and so there's this idea of nation and, and I've always been fascinated. What, what is it that, that we're defending? What is it that soldiers are fighting for? And do females within that disrupt that in some deep level? Is it, it, do they think they're protecting women and families from an older sense of, of what society is? So that was very interesting to me. I think one of the things that's really coming across here, Rosie, is the, the complexity of the questions that your show is able to ask about military culture, about soldiering, about war itself. And you don't shy away from portraying some of the darker sides of things either, do you? So this is this is a warts and all, this is an honest exploration, which really is breaking down these, these barriers, this sort of sense that it's a world unknown to us. You really are exposing all sorts of aspects of military culture you know from from banter to harassment and then these bigger questions about why we fight I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about how audiences have responded to that you mentioned that you sometimes put the show on in in military situations sometimes in theatre so you have a mix of civilian and military audiences maybe first of all how have military audiences tended to respond yes and, and, and I think that that's when the show really really works um quite early on I decided that the show always be a post-show talk so it's really essential that I'm there and, and and I'm able to talk about my experiences that the dancers have a chance to talk and say no no I'm not a soldier I'm a dancer I don't know everything you know this has come through Rosie and through working you know having they all have a little bit of experience with working with the army and then we always have a military person there just sort of to go back because the first thing that a civilian audience will say is is does this ring true because it felt really authentic but you know this is a dance show <laughs> have they got this right and you need that military person they've always said yes it does reflect the military so the, the funny thing is um soldiers and officers always are very skeptical i managed to convince some people high enough up to let us in but then every base we go to, we encounter the, the pushback at some point and we have to kind of stand our ground and say, no, we are doing this show and we're doing it in your drill hall. And this is what's going to happen. And we know that you can chuck us out at any point. We're aware of that. But once they see the show, oh, my goodness, it completely changes. Totally. And we know that. And we know that. So we wait. One officer said it was like going through a six month tour in one hour. 
another very senior soldier said he's in charge of thousands of troops. It made him think about the responsibility ha he has to every single individual and their life and their safety. And that was kind of quite a sobering thought to just sort of pull him back to why every life matters. I, I think we've only really had one, one brigadier who was very old school, red coat, and he was, he was very good in the post shed talk, he was very respectful, but then afterwards, once everyone had gone, he was very angry with me and said that this was, a, this was dangerous because it could put people off joining because it shows the injury and it would put off real soldiers and it might give them fear going into battle because they might think about the risk of injury. And that directly contradicted some of the work I was doing with five rifles in Paderborn so the average reading age of this major's uh, troops was, was nine years old. And when the soldiers were going out and they're getting ready deployment to Afghanistan, they were given a book like two inches thick that they were to read in the event of injury. You are to read this. This is what will happen to you. This is what will happen to your family. And if you're in Germany, that means you're, you're out, you're back in Britain and you're sometimes looking for accommodation. And she said, nobody's, nobody's reading this. Nobody's reading these guides. And everybody's thinking that they're going to soldier into Afghanistan and not get injured. But actually, it was one in four uh, patrols was ending in either death or, or profound injury. So I kind of felt that in this day and age, <laughs> we should be examining what the risks are. And, and people, particularly families, should be preparing for such a kind of injury full warfare. Very interesting. So clearly audiences see something that's really authentic. The brigadier was anxious about that. But, you know, your show is actually performing an incredibly important role from what you've just said in terms of perhaps waking people up to the reality of very modern warfare and the, the risk of bodily injury. I was wondering whether women in the audience in particular, you know, was the brigadier's anxiety perhaps also that there might be fewer women joining up? Do you think that it's a show that might make women think twice? Or is it a show that perhaps gives women the power of knowledge, the power of, uh, you know, foresight somehow in actually being better able to understand a culture that they're going into? Well, I think what was interesting was this show came along at the time when General Sinek Carter was preparing Army 2020 and was really making a huge effort that the army got rid of some of these outdated attitudes and some of these outdated practices. So I know that certain initiation rites still happen, but they are absolutely forbidden. They really are. They're really cracking down on this and they're cracking down on all sorts of homophobic, racist, misogynistic attitudes. There's just not a place for it in, in the army anymore. And so I think what was just a kind of a matter of timing that there was still an old school that was saying, this is, this is contemporary dance, this is the army gone woke, you know. But there was another lot saying, we need to be a modern army and we need to represent the modern country that we are in all aspects. And so I felt confident that we were shining a light on difficult things and practices that, sh that needed to be talked about. I always found with female soldiers and female officers, what they loved about the show is that the female always keeps up, always, whether it be drill or whether it be firefight, the female's absolutely, in fact, she's, she's probably the least exhausted out of all of them. And then when the shit really happens, who's organising them all? Her. She's organising them all. And so I think the women go, yeah, no, we've always, you know, we've suffered this, that and the other, you know. But actually, it shows a very, very strong, capable female as well. Yeah, I think it's a rounded portrayal. And then I also find that women from any walk of life have gone through some kind of sexual harassment, sexual assault, you know, to more serious matters. So it's, it's for me, it's also shining a light on this happens to all women. This could ha this happened to me in a nightclub you know, in, in, in Malvern, it's, it doesn't need to be a military environment. It's just a military environment really heightens some of these tensions and um, sexual tensions. As, as you were talking about these uh, different audience reactions, Rosie, I was also wondering about the differences between visualizing, representing these things uh, in, in dance 
and in film, because obviously you're not the first person to talk about serious military injuries. I mean, there, there, there's so many war films around that graphically portray military injuries, but I'm, I'm, just, I'm just wondering whether the experience of these things uh, is more immediate when you see it in choreography and dance because it's so physical and because obviously we automatically, you know, mirror neurons and all of this, we, yeah. we kind of re-experience what we see other people do uh, in front of us. So I'm, I'm just wondering whether this is part of why some people react with more immediacy than, than, it, than it maybe would if they just saw it as a movie. Well, it's funny you say that because in the years leading up to making Five Soldiers, I'd been part of a big uh, multidisciplinary research project called Kinesthetic Empathy. And it was exactly trying to find out if watching dance either triggered mirror neurons or some kind of level of empathic response. And as a piece of research I was involved with, it was really interesting, which was using fMRI scanning. I did the same piece of dance, exactly the same piece of dance, about five minutes long, once to classical music, once to electronic music, and once in silence with just the breath and the sound of the bodies on the floor. And we showed them to participants and we measured their brain patterns. And with the classical music, um, observers of dance put the movement and the music together and it fired up, no, excuse me, I'm not an expert here, but fired up sort of mathematical pattern recognition parts of the brain. The electronic music didn't have such a profound effect, but in silence, it had a hugely varying effect on people. People either loved it or hated it and they loved it or hated it for the same reasons. The people that hated it said it made them see the effort. It made them think about us as humans. It made us suddenly seem very real and sweaty and they saw the effort. And the people that loved it said that it made them see us as real, as human, that they saw the effort, that they saw the sweat and the, and the, and the sort of pain going into it as well. So that was really fascinating. So we took that research when I went into the studio, particularly with Annie, um, and the score. And so you'll find this moment where the score almost sort of slips out and you'll hear only just like a very high whistle or something. And that's often where we're using the boots to kind of punctuate and create this kind of rhythm with the drill, or we're letting the body slam to the floor and you can feel that weight of the bodies there. Remembering you're on, you're on three sides, you, you can almost like, you know, smell the sweat off them. And so like finding ways to engage with what people call, so that kind of reaction, uh, we felt was like a gut response. People described it as a gut response to actually elicit and deliberately sort of create the work. So it's sonic, it's, it's visual you've got to think a little bit it's not just presented it's not didactic you have to do a little bit of work to decipher what's happening it was deliberate but it was it was lucky as well that it worked <laughs> and um ju just to follow up on this um for a moment i wanted to ask about the kinds of movement that people see on on stage you said at the beginning in particular you were trying to kind of translate the typical sort of drill and physical education movements into dance. But as you watch the video, you also get the impression that a lot of these dance movements that you see were inspired in some way by movements that you would see maybe in combat action, people kind of, what you were saying, jumping out of the window. Can you say a bit more about to, to what extent these kind of real life movements that, that you could see also firsthand, how they inspired the dance movements that, that you see on stage? For me, there was a little bit like a golden rule, really. It, choreography was either military movement, which we had to get right, because if you get a detail wrong, soldiers will be, oh, this is rubbish, or you've got that wrong. Even that, you know, silly things like shoelaces, but movement particularly, movement and strategic movement had to be right. And then push that as far as it could go choreographically without it starting to look like Monty Python School of Silly Walks or something. You know, there, there's just a moment that if you push it too far, it becomes unbelievable. So that was like, get it right, learn it, train with experts, I mean, eagle-eyed on like how they position their knees. You know, we got complimented on how we hold our rifles. There are no weapons. It, it's just the way they, where they put their hands and where their eye is that makes suddenly absolutely invisible rifle appeared to a soldier which is just remarkable but then the other choreographic rule on the other hand 
was trying was was using my skills as a choreographer as a dance somebody who dances was to really show the psychological side like like I said about the moments of beauty or the moments of joy or the moments of fear or the friendships and the loves those I wanted to find as rich a choreographic language as if I were choreographing a piece that had nothing to do with the army you know so I wanted them I wanted that to be really to go on these flights of fancy but to be rooted in real people real personalities so again we're coming back to this idea that the, the there's a huge authenticity to do with your you know very very extensive research that soldiers can recognize themselves yeah. in this show but that it speaks to something bigger it represents a much bigger set of experiences I wonder what is it that you really want civilian audiences specifically to take away from the show what are you trying to communicate to them well, I suppose going back to like my research period, the MOD were releasing casualty figures, but they were actually still withholding the injury figures for up to three months. So the British public were unaware of the injury levels, and I felt quite upset and angry about that. Things changed, of course, because Help for Heroes, Walking with the Wounded, different charities sprung up because of this need to support these injured soldiers. But this is my, my understanding is the soldiers don't send themselves to war in a democracy. It is the politicians uh, that make those decisions. Um, the army don't decide where they go to war, who they go to war with or when they go to war. But once they're told to go to war, they go to war and they try and do the job, you know, as best they can. So that means, you know, it's up, we vote for those politicians. It's up to us as civilians to be asking questions of our politicians as to why and when and how we go to war. Vice versa, when soldiers come back from war, now they can be, you know, very physically maimed or harmed, but they also have all those hidden mental health, post-traumatic stress disorders, which may not show up for five, 10, sometimes even longer. We, as a civil society, have a duty to bring them back into civilian life and to help them with that. It is such an extreme training. You don't just walk in and walk out. It's not like any other job. You have to be fully initiated into it. What is the process of, of not being a soldier anymore? Lots of soldiers feel, veterans feel that they will always be a soldier. You know, what are those processes? And we have a responsibility to help people, not just leave them, to struggle. And the army is always about a live living army. It isn't about former soldiers. So there's a, there's a missing part of the jigsaw there. And I felt, you know, that's, that's just crazy. I'm just uh, pairing some thoughts about doing some talks with the army at the Fringe, uh, this festival. And I'm really questioning, you know, what, where's the front line now? If the body was the front line in 2010, you know, maybe that's changed. I think that kinetic warfare, would the British public tolerate that? And is it now going into more secret sort of places and secret services rather than mainline national armies? I wonder what the future of warfare will be. I'm not sure it will be exactly the same. Who knows? It's really interesting that you bring that up because I'm getting the impression from everything that you've said that, that in a sense your show is part of a slightly wider interrogation you've mentioned walking with the wounded help for heroes is actually relatively new charities that are bringing injury more into public sight one of our other podcast guests coming up is johnny guy lewis who works for the soldiers arts academy among other things and he's also very interested in this sort of debt that society owes to soldiers especially as they transition out of soldiering and into civilian life and so your your show has really touched on a very current issue current when when you developed it but it's just really interesting to hear you talking about how in fact you know in the short space of time since you first developed it perhaps the front line has moved and soldiering is is it ever evolving so I suppose that takes me on to another question which is in what ways have you been updating five soldiers as you've gone along of course there's now a show 10 soldiers so it's it's got bigger but in what other ways have you been updating it to reflect the, sort of the changing nature of warfare in the 21st century? So Ten Soldiers was an invitation from the Hippodrome in Birmingham. 
the Maker of Five Soldiers, but for the large scale. And the large scale is a very, very different medium. You know, you can't sit people on three sides and smell that sweat. You know, it's, it becomes much more epic and it becomes more filmic. So we increased the cast and that also gave us a chance to add more diversity into the cast, which again was important and a shifting part of the army's identity now. With 10 soldiers, the bit that I hadn't done in five, so when you meet the soldiers in five soldiers, they're already soldiers. I'd never explored from recruitment into becoming a soldier. I hadn't explored that because I hadn't understood it at the time. I just joined an infantry battalion. They were all soldiers. I understood that a lot more and I spent a bit of time going back and looking at um, that basic training and officer training at Sandhurst. And so I did a kind of prelog. The first half now is, is from civilian to soldier. And then the second half follows a bit more the trajectory of five soldiers, but with a bigger cast, more epic, some stronger pieces of music in there. We've got Metallica, we've got Ride of the Valkyries in there because I couldn't resist it. I'm quite faithful to the original show. I feel like it was so in detail of its time and the strategy and the tactics of particularly Afghanistan. I, I'm, I'm faithful to that as a choreographer that, that, and that works and that tells a story. I think if I, were, if I were going forward, I mean, I'm already thinking about it, you know, what, what is this state of gray zone? You know, what is this like place we're in now? Where, where we're both not at war, but it's not totally peace either. It's not a cold war, it's a sort of strange place. And it links more to my other work, MK Ultra, which was about conspiracy theory, brainwashing and information. How now attitudes and the mental state is a front line in some regards. I'm not sure where I'd go next. Strangely though, there's something about five soldiers that, that could be a thousand years old. You know, if I read Kaius von Kreuzfitz, of course, you know, researching this 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 piece, and and if you know, if you're going to use force, you use the utmost force. <laughs> if you're going to use violence, you use lethal violence. You know, I find that still really horrific about humanity, but it's true. That's what the armed forces, they're removing it from random individual violence and it's state-sanctioned violence. So will there always be a need for that? I, I mean, I hope not, but while we're still at war, then I'd probably rather have trained professionals doing it than rabble armies. Rosie, you were saying that it's actually a big step moving from a smaller stage to a, a bigger stage and there are different challenges involved. So I was just wondering whether you could tell us a bit more about those differences and about how a show changes and it's presented on a bigger, a more epic scale. There are two things I was thinking about. What, one of the difficult things, but also the beauty of dance, is that you can switch meanings very, very quickly. And so a touch that can be a harmful touch can suddenly become a loving touch, or a body that feels attracted to suddenly be repulsed. Particularly with the female soldier, she starts off being alone stretching, Then she becomes a girl in a club dancing and enjoying the attention. Then she realizes that this is dangerous attention. Then she becomes an animal of prey. This is all sort of as she goes round and round. Then she runs to fight for her life. Then she screams and terrifies them and shames them. And then the worship scene has probably about eight or 10 meanings from wanting to be touched and worshiping her feet to then elevating her to sort of a Buddhistia, queen and country, you know, and then back into a normal person again. And that's, so it's sort of only about four or five minutes, but there's like multiple, multiple meanings. And the skill of that dancer, not just to understand all of those meanings, but to portray those so that that audience can catch just that one eye that's flirty. And then that one flirty eye becomes a bit more of a scared eye. Like that attention to detail is, is, is quite difficult. The people that really know Five Soldiers really missed Five Soldiers when they saw 10 Soldiers because when you're in Five Soldiers and that, that proximity to it, you absolutely feel you're, you're one of them, with them. Whatever your viewpoint is when you come in, by the end, somehow you're with them um, or you're complicit in some way. 
you've watched it, you've been an observer, and more than that, you've almost joined in with them. I think with 10 soldiers, it's a little harder as a maker to get that complicity built in. It had to happen in slightly different ways, slightly more visual, slightly more oral. And that group of soldiers need, needs to kind of, you know, you need to kind of find more power to come out forward rather than pulling everybody in. So it was like a different mode, both of choreographing and then a very different mode of performing as well. And do you think that audiences have different expectations of a bigger show? You talked about it having more filmic qualities and being more epic. And of course, those are genres that, you know, we regularly see war represented in. So do you think that factors into how the audience responds? Well, you, you really do have different audiences. Um, you have different audiences on the small, medium and large scale. They, 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 they don't necessarily cross over. So if you've gone to your local art centre and you've seen that Five Soldiers is in a military drill hall, it could be behind the wire somewhere, you've really made an effort. You've searched us out. You've been recommended. You've made a big effort to get somewhere to go into this space. So you've already got an audience that's niche and that understands this is a niche art form. When you go to a massive, great big theatre, you know, the, your other dance works are gonna be things like Matthew Bourne or ballet. Um, you have an expectation more to sit back, get some nice things to eat and be entertained. So I think you still can pack a punch. You can still put a powerful message in, but you need it to be an enjoyable experience rather than one of these gritty secret, <laughs> you know, like somebody searching out thrills might find us in an army base. Somebody wanting to just think about something and enjoy something might go to a large scale show. So I, I do try and think about what, what expectations an audience has. Literally in those theatres, the, the different spaces give you different expectations. So uh, Rosie, one of the things that sort of clearly emerges for me out of what you've been saying today is that one of the key things about your work, about five soldiers, about 10 soldiers, is really, is really about raising questions, making people think about various aspects that have to do with war, the representation of war, the role of the body uh, that comes out of your own personal experience, where, where your mind sort of processed your injury in terms of a, of a battle injury. So there's a question of the physicality of things. There are these social questions. There are the questions of how does battle work? You, you were saying it's not didactic. And I found that very interesting because it's, uh, it's not didactic in the sense is that there's nobody who tells you here's a lesson. But we through this kind of bodily engagement by proxy that we as the audience have all these lessons sort of on this thinking that, that emerges. But it also warns us against doing this kind of a one to one thing where we think, oh, there's something, it's, this happened, so we see it on stage. This is more about experiences. It's about, yeah, with these archetypes that we've been talking about. Um, is, that, is, is that a fair way of sort of summing up what, you, what, you're, what you're hoping to achieve with your work? Well, it, well it's, it's interesting because I don't know if it's specifically unique to Britain, this relationship it has with the, with the military, um, but it seemed that it, it's either left or right and it's quite polarised and that even looking at and talking about the military was somehow in some ways right wing. And I thought that was a little bit of a strange perspective, actually, and, and really hid the truth from so many people, whether that be jingoistic, well, hey, you know, uh, brave heroes or whether it be I don't want anything to do with it because I'm against war. Thus, I don't want to even know anything about it. Both seem to be myopic to me. Again, it's going back to that, don't look away, don't flinch. Like, who are these people? What do they actually do? Why is it important to society? And stop pushing it off into this kind of male <laughs> domain. Like, let's bring it right forward and let's have a look at it. That's what I wanted to do. And like I said right at the beginning, it, it was terrifying. It still is a bit terrifying. <laughs> But strangely, you can find you can try and find a truth um, to look at very difficult subject matter in in through dance. I, I think that's exactly what your shows do achieve. They look very honestly, open mindedly and in really exploratory ways. As you said, you use the phrase opening up dialogue, partly also breaking down barriers. And, and addressing the fact that, as you say, 
often military activity is hidden, it's pushed to one side, it's a sort of, it's almost something that one doesn't talk about. There are so many assumptions about it. And, you know, staging five soldiers and then 10 soldiers in their various ways is really opening up the conversation about that, bringing it front and centre and reminding us that this is part of the world we live in, as you say. It's been part of the world we live in for millennia, fortunately continues to be. I think one of the other things that that your show, as Nicholas has just said, really does, which is of huge interest to the Visualising War project, is really explore these habits of visualising war, what the medium of dance specifically can do in terms of the physicality, but the also representing ideas as much as experiences and raising questions. So Rosie, it's been really fantastic talking to you and finding out more about the development of it and the huge impact of five soldiers and ten soldiers. As Nicholas mentioned earlier, um, listeners can find a full performance of Five Soldiers on Rosie Kay's website. And there's also a a nice tantalising clip of ten soldiers on there. Rosie, the pandemic's obviously got hugely in the way of performances and so on. (laughs) Are there plans to tour 10 soldiers in future? And you mentioned also some talks coming up at the Fringe. Are there things that people can perhaps start to book? Yes, so we're not sure about what to do with 10 soldiers. It was meant to be touring, I think it was this autumn we had plans for, but now we're premiering Romeo and Juliet instead. So yeah, we, we, you know, it's a difficult time and theatres are, are trying to figure out what, what what's going forwards. We've got basically too many shows <laughs> at the moment, both making or being made and also existing. But yes, I've been working with um, Lieutenant Colonel Gordon McKenzie up at Army at the Fringe and I'm sort of just in the early days of putting together a, two days of talks that explore this idea around the grey zone, about the is the mind the new front line and cyber you know, if the army's going into places like cyber and space, you know, what does that do to science fiction writers? And, you know, are we are we entering a new realm um, where, where, where the army is going to places that it's never been before? Um, so those will be happening in early August. Well, we'll look forward to those. Uh, yes, thank you so much, uh, Rosie, for joining us today on the show. And thank you, all our listeners, for joining us again. And we hope you enjoyed this conversation with Rosie Kay as much as we have. Do keep tuning in to the Visualising War podcast. Next time, we'll be talking to artist and author Harry Parker. Harry was one of the soldiers Rosie met when she embedded with four rifles. And as she mentioned earlier, she actually developed part of the five soldiers storyline in response to the injuries that Harry suffered while on tour in Afghanistan. And in their different ways, both Rosie's show and Harry's novel, Anatomy of a Soldier, really explore uh, the, the kind of warfare that goes on in Afghanistan, particularly what happens when you tread on an IED. Harry's novel, Anatomy of a Soldier, means that we'll actually be staying focused on the body as a way to visualise war, but looking at it through a different medium. And if you'd like to support our project, please share and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or any other platform that you use so you don't miss an episode. And please do leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts because that really helps people find the show. And if you would like to join the conversation further, you can follow us on social media, just search for Visualizing War or get in touch directly with us by emailing viswar at standrews.ac.uk. Our theme music was composed by Jonathan Young. The show was mixed by Sophia Gertin. Thank you for listening.